Welcome to the latest in uh, the Zionist Organization of America's series of emergency briefings in response to the genocidal massacre by Palestinian Arabs against Israelis on October 7th. My name is Steve Feldman. I'm executive director of the Greater Philadelphia Chapter of the Zionist Organization of America. Uh, and I welcome you to this event. Uh, these are obviously very difficult times for our brothers and sisters in Israel and for uh, Jews and supporters of Israel worldwide. Uh, we're going to be getting a firsthand report today uh, from the city of Sterot, a city that had been uh, one of 35,000 people up until October 7th. Uh, and you're all aware of what happened on October 7th. And now I understand that it is a, uh, a ghost town there, but we're going to hear directly from Rabbi Ari Katz, who is the Public Relations Director for the Hezder Yeshiva in Sterot. We were hoping to have the founder and Rosh Yeshiva, Rabbi David Fendel, but uh, something has come up and he cannot be with us. So we've got Rabbi Ari Katz. And just by way of introduction, the Hezder Yeshiva has about 640 students currently. Uh, there's about 140 graduates uh, serving in the IDF right now. According to the latest stats that I saw, Rabbi Katz can and clarify that. Uh, and uh, viewers may be interested in knowing that Rabbi Katz uh, formerly is, is from Gush Katif before moving to steroids. So he's he's had some experience. Rabbi Katz, welcome. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And thank you for all the participants for coming and joining us in these challenging times. So uh, unfortunately, Rabbi Fendel uh, has not was not been able to be here today. But uh, I know that you are as as well versed uh, in the situation uh, prior to October seventh, and certainly since October seventh. So uh, let's just get into it right away. Uh, what happened in terms of magnitude was new uh, on October seventh, but but Sterot and Advirons have been facing, I guess, thousands, uh, more than twenty thousand rocket attacks uh, in twenty years. Can you? Uh, explain uh, to our audience a little bit about the background. Sure, Steve. So, yeah, so basically, rockets are not new to Sterot. Sterot has been having, has been under constant rocket attack since, uh, to be exact, uh, 2001. So, for the last 22 years, 22 and a half years, like you said, the number to over, over 25,000 really rockets have fallen in Sterot and the surrounding area. So, rockets has not been new. I think. Last time I checked, I think um, the number was there had been since 2005 after we left Gush Katif. OK, for the, the rocket started before Gush Katif, four years beforehand, when we were still and those of you who aren't familiar with Gush Katif, when we were still when there were exact, or approximately 10,000 Jews living there. The army was still there in the Gaza Strip. They were still able to shoot, but very only to stay road and the neighboring kibbutzim uh, that are nearby, nothing further than that. Of course, after we left and Hamas took over in uh, 2006, uh, so things got a lot worse. And I think I saw the numbers saying there have been 15 operations. They don't like to call it wars. This is the first right. time we have a war, okay? Uh, I think the operations, and if you ask me the different names, I probably can name you 10, maybe. I mean, uh, trivia-wise, 15 operations since 2006, Till present day. So this war, Swords of Iron, is the first time they're calling it a war because that's what it is. They started, Hamas opened up, they declared war. Thank God they're calling it a war. So the rockets were not, it basically wasn't something new. And uh, like I said, the, the people in Sterling, it's it's a hard sentence for me to even say, have learned to learn with, have learned to live with the rockets. Terrible. What they haven't learned to live with was what happened on October 7th to have terrorists uh, come into a city. Now, terrorists came and you have to mention the kibbutzim that were massacred. I mean, Sterot, thank God, was spared the massacre, okay, because it's a city, okay? It's a lot bigger than the kibbutzim. But still, I think the numbers given by the mayor and the story still coming out. I mean, it was such a balagan, like we say, around uh, 28 people were killed that day from the terrorists, including the policemen in the police station and people that they were shooting. There was a famous story, I think Fendel mentioned it, that the first, uh, when terrorists came in the city early, early in the, that morning, 
the first people they encountered were a bunch of senior citizens uh, going on a t go, supposed to go on a trip, a day trip to the Dead Sea. And there was a siren because they, they were shooting as the, they were shooting simultaneously with uh, coming into the coming into all the, the kibbutzim in the cities. And uh, the, the senior citizens got off the bus and they were mowed down, so to say, by the terrorists Horrible. that morning. Horrible. So 28 people and a lot of there were still miracles. And uh, if you Steve, if you allow me to share, um, I, I wasn't there that day. OK, specifically, but. There was one thing which, even if I'm going to mention it now, is very eerie. Just to maybe give you, the viewers, an idea what the boys were going through. Remember, this was Shabbat. This was the holiday of Simchat Torah. Now, we always pride ourselves that the yeshiva is very connected to the community. And Simchat Torah is one of our, we look forward to all year long, because that's the day where the boys get up early in the morning to dive in, in the yeshiva. Why? Because they want to afterwards finish by them and then go around the shuls in the city. And that specific morning at 6.30, when everything started, you know, basically getting out of control and they started hearing the gunshots, they locked down the yeshiva. And they were in lockdown basically for more than 24 hours, okay? that. But when I say lockdown, the boys who were there who already done army and some of the rabbis, they went out to join the fighting they wanted to join the fighting with the police and the army, what was going on. They took whatever guns they had and they joined the fighting. Um, the medics, we have a lot of medics, the volunteer from Again David Adom, they went out there to treat, unfortunately, the people who were injured. But I want to fast forward. Apparently, probably sometime Saturday night when the boys were still there, they couldn't leave. We found writing on one of the walls in the dormitory. Uh, very eerie. It's out there. We, we spread it out in our emails. Basically, if I paraphrase, the boy was saying, I don't know if we're going to survive. And if we don't survive, we love you all. Hopefully we'll be successful in this in this war. And he tries to tell people what's going on that day. He's saying that he's writing like very like bullet points. Uh, these are terrorists and there's rockets and the police station was taken over. So very eerie that the boys probably had a feeling that they didn't know what their end was going to be. That's how serious it was. And that's how traumatized they still are. And, and when was the city evacuated? How long so, did it take? Okay. So let me be careful here. The city that they don't want to use the word evacuate. They okay. like, to, they're still using the word is they wrote, they're going out for in Hebrew, they say hitranenut to a little bit of uh, R and R. OK, because they, they they would because they didn't they allowed anyone who wanted to leave to leave. OK, so that started immediately. That already started Sunday, the Sunday, October 8th. It already started October 8th. Um, as we speak today, based on the numbers that we have, that I've heard that the mayor said out of thirty five thousand people, they're probably around around thirty thousand have left more or less. OK, that's the first time ever that that many people have left. Now the army is in a way happy because that allows them more, you know, leeway to do, they don't have to worry about protecting steroids. That even, I'll tell you even, I'm gonna tell you this, uh, it doesn't sound politically correct, but the army apparently hasn't been using the Iron Dome the last couple of days because they know most people aren't there. So there've been a lot of buildings, homes, the yeshiva, have been all been hit by rockets. Yes. You saw the photos. These thank, th now, thank God the last couple of days there have never been any casualties. If I'm not mistaken, last week, you know, last week there was a casualty. Um, but uh, right now the city is more or less a ghost town. They keep on shooting every day, at least once a day. From I see it from the apps on my phone, there is a I, there's a red alert to stay road. I mean, there are a lot of places they're shooting, but stay road. Uh, so let the, I said, let them shoot, let them waste their ammunition on an empty city. Okay, I don't know what they know, uh, but uh, and and I say this, I said this to Steve before, and I'll tell all of you this uh, that you know I always proud proud was always proud to say that the people in stay road are modern day heroes. Their resilience is something that we all learn from. Right. I'm afraid and I'm nervous that this time might be a little bit different because there's one thing to have rockets being shot at you. It's a whole different ball game when you have terrorists coming into your city. So I said, it'll be very simple. What the army does, 
God willing, the next couple of days, weeks, maybe months. The results of that, I think, will determine what sterol looks like in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, tell, our, uh, tell our viewers, please, Rabbi, the proximity of steroid to the border with Gaza. The proximity is basically less than a mile. Mm -hmm. Less than a mile. That means stay road. I always used to tell people they don't need rockets to stay road. They also can have sniper fire, which they have done. It has been for years, but they have also shot sniper fire. That's how close it is. And and when I was there in, in May uh, 2022 and, and ZOA and its Israel mission always stops in stay road and at the yeshiva, we had a wonderful lunch. And then we were right. up on the roof and, and could really see uh, exactly um the proximity. I mean, you could see with the naked eye Gaza, uh, and and now to know what's happening and what came from there um, has to have a chilling uh, effect. Uh, Great, now, Steve. I'll, I'll tell you this. I hope that when I bring you up next time on the roof, you won't see what you saw before. Okay, that 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 I'm hoping very much so that you will not see those buildings from Gaza, from the roof. And uh, yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll obviously we'll see. Um, what the army has in mind and what the army god willing can can yes. accomplish down there uh if anybody has questions uh please put them in the q a we'll try and leave some time for questions uh uh towards the end it's going to be if quick. i could if yeah, can, I, can i okay yeah so i just wanted to say i think you know everyone i get questions every day and i'm happy i get these questions because it shows how many people care around the world and what can people do Okay, you know, so already now there are missions coming. I already know we already got calls and different communal rabbis are coming and uh, which is great, which is beautiful. And that, that that's that that's going to strengthen us and to show that, you know, that people care and coming to Israel. And uh, the only problem is that unlike previous missions, they were able to come to stay road to the yeshiva. Now, where I have told Steve this before, the yeshiva now is uh, moving from location to location. I don't know. We, I can never tell you where we're going to be for how long and which location. Okay. That's part of the problem mm -hmm. that we're in now that we have never been in a situation like this ever. Uh, but there's so many things that you can do from far, starting from basic things. Of course, I tell people about praying. I think I don't have to tell you that about praying. And in, uh, a lot of people speak about, been speaking about that and prayer could be a game changer. And that's number one. Number two, um, any, any type of communication with the different circles of people who are most involved. That means soldiers, soldiers getting letters. I could talk personally here. I, yesterday, my son got off. He was in, he's been in out for two weeks. They got him off for 12 hours to see his wife and his little baby. I took him back to the base. I want to tell you, what I with tears in my eyes saying goodbye to him, but at the same time, feeling so proud, seeing what's going on down south there, the amount of troops they have there. I mean, you see the people, Am Israel, the Jewish people at its best. Unbelievable. You see there, I mean, again, the same same sites, that this wife saying goodbye to her husband, this father saying goodbye to his son. But you see the power, what we can do if they only allow us to do it, and hopefully do it right. Mm -hmm. So writing letters to soldiers, writing letters to the people of Stay Road and the kibbutzim that have been massacred and what they went through. I mean, these people are now in hotels. They Some of these people have lost everything, okay? Lost their dear ones, lost their homes, okay? That's also, I, I'm tomorrow, God willing, one of my plans are, are to go to the hotels, some of the hotels in Jerusalem at least, and to see up close if there are any immediate needs, what these people need, okay? Also from Stay Road and also from out, but many of the people I know from Stay Road, but um, also to see the other people there. So writing letters to them, writing letters to the families who have lost their dear ones, okay? That's also, you know, something which we can't even imagine. Some people already have gotten up from the seven day morning period. Some people are still starting because they even haven't, there's still 200 and over 210 people, that last number that the army gave last night, who are still hostages. Mm -hmm. There are, are so many, there are hundreds of people that haven't identified yet from the massacre that day. So you imagine what families are going through. So getting a, a letter from someone from Philadelphia, from wherever it is, can mean the world. And I will mention, 
Don't how ask can people me. do that, Rabbi? How can people? So I've been telling people, I mean, I don't know any other way, but if people, if you, Steve, could be the middleman here, people even by emails or whatever it is, I will give those emails to people, okay? Yep. I will send them because I want it tomorrow. One of the things I want to do tomorrow is uh, what these hotels are supposed to have. They're supposed to have a some type of point person that is in charge of all these things and the needs of the community. So I wanted to try to tell, ask them, like more like we say in Hebrew, tachlis, what how to do that. I mean, I know people have started that already. I think that other organizations have started letter writing, but I want to be able to also be able to handle that. And the last thing I'll tell you, if I talk about the yeshiva, so uh, just we're having a campaign and I tell people, I'm not embarrassed to say it. Um, the money that is in our campaign will be used, probably the majority of it for afterwards. And I keep on telling people this. Now... <laughs> You know, we're in the middle. I think we're at the beginning still. Okay. Yeah. Afterwards, the amount of rehabilitation and rebuilding emotionally, the buildings that were destroyed in Stay Road, that the government takes care of. And I'm not worried about that as much. I'm worried more about the people, the kids, yeah. the trauma that has hit them now even worse than beforehand. I mean, Not everybody, only everybody under under twenty has has PTSD, and as Rabbi Fendel corrected me when I mentioned that when I was there, there's no P; it's not post. Yeah, and I think present. now it's present. I think, I think now after the terrorists coming in, I think it's not only kids; it's also adults. I mean, yeah. I know I would be. It's it's scary. So by us, you could see, you could read about the campaign on our website friendsofstayroad.org, friendsofstayroad one word friendsofstayroad.org. And you'll see there, I, I know what we always pride ourselves, like I said before, is helping the community. I already told you, Fendel, I think here we're going to play a very, very important part. And I don't know how many funds they're going to be. I don't know who's going to, everyone's going to be, of course, wanting the funds. But I can tell you that we will make sure if it's the kids, activities for the kids, if it's whatever, we will have to sit down afterwards. Now's the time. That's why tomorrow I might, I might get a, a, a feel that there might be immediate needs right now, that the government, the government's supposed to be supplying needs also now. I know there are a lot of good people out there for now. They're volunteering at the hotels, giving the kids, you know, uh, different things and diapers for the mothers, to, for, for, the, you know, for the babies. Um, afterwards, it's going to be a, a, a whole operation. Rabbi, I, mean, I want to take I want to take a step back, and please. I have a question to lead into what I'm going to ask you. Go ahead. For the benefit of our audience who may not know, uh, what specifically is a hedge there, Yeshiva? How does that differ from uh, a typical, if you will, <laughs> Yeshiva? Okay, so Hest Yeshiva, which is, and I'll tell you a story in a second, something else which came uh, to light is Hest Yeshiva is where the boys, the young men, they combine their army services. The army service with their studies. This was a Hester in Hebrew means arrangement. This was an arrangement made by the first prime minister of Israel, Ben Gurion, when he, when the state was established, and he saw there are a lot of good young guys who want to keep on learning uh, Torah studies, but they also want to serve the country. So how do you do both together? So we decided on this plan that you'll have the 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 best of both worlds. A young man will be able to learn, continue his learning. If he wants to afterwards to be a rabbi or to be a teacher or not even that, just he wants to continue his learning and also serve the country. That was maybe why, um, in a way, the having this having a Hester Yeshiva, boys with guns that day was a good thing. But well, that's what I wanted more. to bring. That's what I wanted to bring out because the, the police station is is what about across the street? Uh, uh, basically, the a block, a three minute walk. I walked yeah. it last week. I wanted to make sure it took me three minutes to walk. Now I'll tell you what came to light. So I've been telling people. It was a miracle that the terrorists didn't come there also, because that would have been the perfect target for them. What better target than to hit a place where the boys do army there? Yes, we have soldiers there. You have okay. So I've been telling people that apparently this is what one of the rabbis told me uh, a few days ago, based on what the police or the Shabak, the Shimbet, what's yeah. parallel to the FBI in, in America, they basically said that the, that that was the plan. The terrorist wanted to come to hit the yeshiva after the police station. Okay, that was the plan. They even threw a grenade at the back gate of the yeshiva, which did not explode. Mm. Okay, now I saw, now I could connect that. I saw when I was there last week, I saw one of the their buggies there that the terrorists used to come into town. It was parked 
right outside the yeshiva, the parking lot going up to the yeshiva from that back gate. So yeah. apparently it was bigger, more of a miracle than we really thought it was because they were planning to come. Thank yeah. God they didn't make it there. Um, and uh, and the and like I said, uh, you know, after this is all over, uh, we have that's why we have a lot of boys. We have like between I think eighty guys now called up. Besides the two hundred guys in the army that are doing their active duty, we also have another eighty guys now who are called up do the miluim, the reserve duty. So we have almost three hundred guys now in the army, basically, as we speak. Mm -hmm. We're very proud of that. They should all come back, like every other soldier, all come back. Shalom. They should all come back peaceful after they do their job. And Amen. I believe that the yeshiva and the city of Sterot will be bigger and better after this is all over. I really believe that. I have complete confidence. I'm optimistic. Again, it all depends on what we do here, but I, 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 do, I do have hope that everything will come back bigger and better than it was before. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, if you want to give out uh, the website for Friends of Steroid or the or the Yeshiva or any yeah, so I think I think someone write. I think someone wrote there. I'll give it again. Friends of Steroid, one word. Friends of org. Friends of org, and you'll see there the campaign. And like I said, I'm not telling you where. There's so many. The main thing is action. Now is the time for action. I think words enough words. Now is the I say that also for the army. You know, you know, you watch the news. 24 7 here i mean that's the way i am and i said myself forget stop what now it's time to do now it's time to do and i think everyone understands that you know enough of the threats that they you know we have to now go ahead and do what we have to do i say the same thing about people who want to help okay now is the time to take action whatever you do just yeah i'm to going to do. talk about that in a minute we, i want to take one question from one of our viewers which is what is the israeli government doing maybe to arm and train civilians in the south uh, going forward, and and if you can very briefly, uh, maybe some people believe or think uh, misconception that that every Israeli civilian is, is armed to the hilt. That's that's not exactly true. Can you oh. talk about uh, the situation very briefly in terms of training yeah, I, and, and civilians? Uh, and is the government going to do anything now going forward? Well, the government is supposed to. I mean, uh, that's the, the 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 Minister of Interior Security really wants to be able to make it possible, a lot easier for every person to get a gun, like you described now. I could tell you what I saw just yesterday, taking my son back to the army. Every, and they said the numbers also in the news. Every community on the way down to stay road, on the way down south there, has guards now stationed, okay, armed guards from the people there. They all basically yeah. now people, every community wants to have a first response team with that's that's armed okay and that's what that because today everyone is saying also in judea and samaria all these communities they're afraid that what they did in aza they'll do also to them so that's why the yeah. government is in, is encouraging those communities to yeah. have and to form if they don't have already security teams first response teams that are guards that they'll take a course even and because this is serious now now after it's always like that we learn our lessons from blood Okay, but now people understand that this is we have an enemy out there and we can't take them lightly and we have to make sure that we're, we're, we're also we're well prepared. That means every community has to make sure that they have security like they should have and are trained. And and God forbid an incident like that happens, you have people there to be able to hold the fort down until the police and army come. So now the government is very uh, encouraging them very much now to, for, first of all, for individuals to get guns and the communities also, every community should have some type of, you know, security team ready. I just want to give out uh, your colleague Buzzy Green's email address for people who want to write to uh, those at the Yeshiva, those of the road. It's M Buzzy Green. That's the letter M B U Z Z Y, the color green at gmail.com. Rabbi, I want to thank you so much. Uh, you are thank all you. in our thoughts and prayers. Thank you again. Thank um, you. Please give our best to Rabbi Fendel. We hope I he's will. okay. We hope everybody is safe and that there is a, a strong future for uh, both the Hester Yeshiva in Sterot and the city of, of Sterot and, and environs. Am Yisrael, Am Yisrael Chai. Am Yisrael Chai. Yes. Uh, I want to speak briefly uh, to our audience 
uh, that you all have a role to play in the information war that we're facing uh, all over the world. There's a lot of misinformation that's being reported by the media. Uh, we need to react to that. We need to be proactive. And you can have the most impact locally by calling local newspapers, local TV stations, local news radio, local talk radio. Listen closely to what they're reporting. Correct them. Be proactive. Offer yourself as, as an expert. Uh, perhaps they'll interview you. Uh, when you call, if you're calling a newspaper, you want to try and reach the news editor or the managing editor. If you're calling TV uh, stations or radio stations, you want to try and reach the news director. Uh, it's very important to be very proactive right now uh, during this time. Uh, one of the things that, that people are reporting and pundits are saying is that uh, it's not all the Palestinian Arabs, it's, it's just Hamas. Uh, there's a survey company, a Palestinian survey company based in Ramallah, Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research in Ramallah. Uh, overwhelmingly, if there was an election today between uh, Haniyeh of Hamas and Abbas of the Palestinian Authority, Haniyeh would win. Uh, the overwhelming majority, uh, I think it's over 60 percent support uh, in Gaza, support violence over peaceful negotiations. So we need to bear these facts in mind. Uh, among the places you could support uh, with regard to this information war is ZOA. We are trying to engage very strongly. We are engaging very strongly in this information war. If you are in the Philadelphia area and want to reach out to me, you can reach us at office at zoaphilly.org. That's our email, office at zoaphilly.org. Our phone number is 610-660-9466. That's 610-660-9466. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Lee Rosenblum, who is uh, our chief development officer to uh, give you more details on how you can help. Lee, take it away. And thank you very much, Steve. And thank you, uh, Rabbi Katz. Uh, we appreciate your time and all you do for the Jewish people. It was Eli Wiesel who said, I swore never to be silent whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. We must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormented and never the tormented. For the last 125 years, ZOA has been the strong voice for Jews everywhere. Today, our voice can be heard in the halls of justice, the halls of academia, and certainly the halls of Congress. Now is the time to support us because the war has expanded from their shore to our shores, and their war is our war. Help us now. You can donate by check to ZOA, we are a 501c3, or go to www.zoa.org and press the donate now. And the key word is now. Now is the time to raise our voice and to be strong. With your help, we can be and do more. Thank you very much and have a great day. Lee, thank you very much. I want to thank our audience. I want to thank Rabbi Ari Katz and Buzzy Green. Uh, we wish you all uh, health and wealth, uh, health and welfare, pardon me, in Israel and to the uh, Jews around the world. Please be vigilant. These are not normal times. Thank you for joining us today. Please support ZOA. Thank you.